Okay. Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, first speaker for today, Wee Tech An, who will speak to us about dichotomy and how duality for exceptional data correspondences. Thanks very much, uh, Siddha. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for, for the, uh, giving me a chance to speak uh, at this conference. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to speak at a conference uh, dedicated to Steve's 70th birthday. Um, well, so I'm going to talk about a joint work with Gordon Savin uh, on uh, exceptional data correspondences. Um, you know, data, exceptional data correspondence is actually the title of my PhD thesis. So if uh, anyone is wondering, why the heck am I still working on my thesis after more than 20 years uh, out of PhD? Well, I guess uh, perhaps I owe you an, an explanation, okay, but, and, I, and I'll give it in due course in the, you know, somewhere along the way in the talk. Um, but uh, at the beginning, let me, uh, let me start with a little uh, tribute to, uh, to Steve, okay, because uh, I was unable to join the, the you know, Cooler Fest uh, yesterday, because it was at 12 midnight um, over here. And of course, 12 midnight is not so late, in fact. Uh, but it just happened that the night before, I had got up at 3 a.m. to, uh, well, uh, to simultaneously listen to Ben Howard's talk and also to watch the Italy-Spain game in the Euros. And so after that, from 3 to 6, it was a long uh, game. And, and after that, my whole day was just uh, kind of screwed up. And uh, by the time that Luis Garcia was speaking, I was half asleep somehow. Yeah, so unable to join yesterday. I hope it went uh, well. It was fun. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, it was during the time uh, when I was doing my PhD, I guess, that I first uh, um, uh, met Steve. Uh, met in the sense that I, I, I think I might have listened to a talk of his uh, at the Harvard uh, Number Theory Seminar. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm not completely sure of that because uh, I was a graduate student and I remember uh, sitting in this talk where the speaker speaks about um, constructing a chain of supercapacitor by using data leaf to bounce between you know, two towers or something like that. And uh, I also remember that the speaker was quite tall. So, so presumably it is Steve rather than his uh, other co-authors. Um, um, but the first time that I, I was probably introduced to him was uh, um, in 1998, October, shortly after I finished my PhD. Um, there was a workshop at the CRM in Montreal. Um, I think on uh, algebraic modular forms and modular forms mod P. And uh, I gave a talk there on the uh, Ziegler wave formula for in exceptional groups. And um, I recall that Steve gave a series of expository lectures on uh, the doubling method. I mean, the doubling seesaw and doubling zeta integrals. And I re remember being uh, struck by the, uh, just the clarity and, uh, uh, of, of his exposition. Because of course I had tried to learn this stuff before on my own, and I find that after listening to his lecture, somehow the whole thing becomes so clear. And um, I'm sure this is also the experience of uh, many people. And um, and over the past twenty something years, I mean, I have uh, I've always found him to be very encouraging and supportive um, when I speak with him. Um, he was he always look at things uh, in a very positive light, and um, I would say that even uh, you know. After all these years, I'm still, I still continue to be inspired by uh, his work and by reading his uh, papers. So um, indeed, uh, besides my PhD advisor, Dick Gross, um, and my collaborator, Gordon Savin, it's not an exaggeration to say that um, Steve's work probably had the most uh, impact on my, my own work. And uh, in particular, I'd like to start. So let me see if I could move forward. Yeah, I'd like to... Uh, uh, start with this uh, paper of Steve. Uh, as you can see, it was published in 1986. Um, so probably the work was done maybe two or three years before. Uh, so in the first 10 years of his, so in the beginning of his career in some sense. Um, so this is a paper on the local data correspondence and I'm sure many of you know this paper. And to, to get a sense of how uh, the impact that this paper has had, uh, one needs to look no further than the uh, you know, math signet citation page of Steve. You can see this paper is, uh, uh, is his uh, most highly cited uh, paper. And uh, if you look down this list, you see that uh, many of these papers have been mentioned by previous speaker, um, the regularized Ziegler-Weil formula, um, 
um, that's the, the, the one that, uh, that Ben got uh, extra bonus points for, for mentioning that. And uh, the third paper, Splitting Metaplectic Covers, uh, I say this is kind of a technical paper uh, because one has to work with the metaplectic group and then, um, you know, it's technical. But I'll consider this paper as a kind of a great service to mankind, okay? because as anyone who tried to work with covering groups before, you know that there are just landmines everywhere. You can make mistakes, uh, you know, in so many different places. So it was, uh, um, it was really great that uh, someone as careful and as precise as Steve has taken upon himself to, to set down, you know, to write everything down so carefully and uh, uh, correctly. Um, so I think this is a paper that, uh, though technical, is uh, somehow a foundational work that many of us uh, who work on data correspondence rely on. The paper on data dichotomy, this dichotomy is the same dichotomy as the title of my talk, and it is, uh, I guess, a subject matter of that uh, supposed Harvard seminar talk. Okay. Um, the triple product L function was mentioned in Dick Gross's uh, talk on Monday. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this next one, um, was the one that Luis Garcia was carrying around for several months as he was starting his PhD research. And um, I guess one might call this paper as the start of uh, the so-called Kudler's program. Okay, so um, now let's come back to this, uh, you know, this paper on local data correspondence. Um, I want to review uh, briefly what, the, what he did in that paper, okay? So the setting is, uh, house theory of uh, local data correspondence. Um, so we have a quadratic space V and a symplectic space W giving us a reductive dual pair or is it dual reductive pair OV cross SPW mapping to uh, the symplectic group of the tensor product. Uh, now this SP or V tensor W has a so-called Bay representation that we can pull back to this uh, direct product. Now, of course, this is not exactly correct because the Bay representation actually leaves on this uh, metaplectic cover and hence the need to, to split this map into the metaplectic cover, which is the contents of uh, the third paper in the citation list. But uh, let me ignore this issue uh, here. So we have a representation of OV cross SPW and we want to understand how it decomposes into irreducibles. Uh, to formulate that, so if you take a, an irreducible representation pi of OV, you can define what is called the big data leaf. Okay, so I wrote it in this way, which is perhaps not the most common way it has been presented. Uh, whatever it is, it is a smooth representation of the other group, SPW. And uh, the usual way that one talks about it is that pi tensor data pi is the maximal pi isotopic quotient of the Bay representation omega. So this data pi can be thought of as the multiplicity space of pi in this uh, big representation omega. And uh, I guess a basic result uh, uh, in this uh, story is the how duality conjecture now uh, fully known that this smooth representation has a unique irreducible quotient, uh, which will denote by a little data of pi. And moreover, uh, if little data of pi one and pi two are the same, then pi one equals pi two. So, so data gives an injective map from its domain to, to its target. Okay. Um, of course, this uh, how duality conjecture was largely known by the work of How and um, Walsh-Berger since the 80s. And uh, there was only the issue that uh, it was not known in residual characteristic two. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, Takeda and I uh, settled that uh, and in fact, the techniques used in our proof was different from what Wasperger uh, used. It is uh, actually more in line uh, with the techniques used in uh, Steve's paper that we are talking about here. So what are the results? Uh, so I just give an impressionistic uh, summary. Uh, the first was a, a finiteness result that this data pi uh, is not too big. It's, it has finite length. And one consequence of that is that it has irreducible quotients. So if you don't know that it has finite length, it's possible for it to be non-zero and have no irreducible quotients. And uh, that will be a bit strange, okay? Um, but not, the next result is, uh, can be considered as a key step towards the how duality conjecture. If pi is supercuspital, then this big data pi is in fact irreducible or zero, okay? 
Uh, the third thing that was shown in this paper is this so-called tower property. Um, and it says the following. So we are taking, uh, you can consider a tower of symplectic space, Wn of dimension 2n, and you can consider the data leaf of pi to any of this uh, SPWn. And the result is that there is somehow a smallest n naught such that the data leaf is not zero. Subsequently, the leaf will also be non-zero. Um, and that's what this uh, if and only if statement is saying. So this n naught is called the first occurrence index of pi in this tower of data leaf. And what Steve showed is that if pi is supercapacitor, then the, at the first occurrence, the big data, so we already know this big data is irreducible if pi is supercapacitor. So he showed that at the first occurrence, it is the big data of pi is also supercapacitor, but subsequently it is uh, no longer. And uh, in showing this result, um, he also showed the uh, compatibility of data leaf with parabolic induction. So how data leaf, um, well, what does, well, how data leaves behave with respect to capacitor support. Okay, so this somehow, uh, just a brief summary, okay. And uh, this uh, notion of first occurrence index, uh, together with his subsequent work with Raleigh on the Zika Bay formula, led them to formulate the so-called local conservation relation. Okay, um, a very nice result that was uh, a few years ago uh, was shown by Ping Yong Sun and Chen Bo Zhu. So what are the main ingredients is proved? There are two, okay? The first uh, is uh, the computation of the Jacquet module, so the Bay representation. Uh, so what is that? So imagine you take a parabolic P equals MN, say maximal parabolic of uh, one of the members of the dual pair, say SPW. Now you can consider the co-invariance of omega with respect to N. That is a representation of M because M normalized N, but also of OV. And the question, and what Steve did in that paper was to determine this represent this M cross OV module uh, to a large extent. Okay, why to a large extent? Because what he did was he showed that uh, this module has a, a natural equivariant filtration, now uh, called the Kudler's filtration, um, and then he describes the associated graded pieces precisely. And this, uh, so why is this uh, a useful thing to do? Uh, it's because it is useful for determining, for example, if you want to check whether big data of pi is caspita, okay? You know that big data, uh, you know, pi tensor data pi is a quotient of the Bay representation. You apply uh, the co n co-invariance on both sides. Uh, that's an exact functor, so it's still subjective. So if you want to show that data pi is caspita, so that is equivalent to showing that all this co-invariance uh, vanishes, but to show that is uh, the same as showing that pi does not occur in as a quotient of uh, omega n. So, so if you understand omega n very well, so well that you can tell whether pi is a quotient or not, then uh, you know you, you have a chance of showing that data pi is caspita. Okay, so that's uh, just an example of uh, how why this computational jockey module is uh, useful. Uh, the other key ingredient is this doubling seesaw which was, uh, I guess, the subject matter of his talks at this uh, workshop in Montreal in 1998. Uh, so I'm going to come to that uh, later. So I just mentioned it here without uh, explaining how it is used, but I will, uh, later there'll be a slide explaining how this is used. Okay, but at this point, I just want to uh, mention that um, the notion of just this term seesaw pair, I guess, first appeared in this paper of uh, Steve from, uh, 1983. Um, so he wrote here, I want to discuss in an informal style a certain structure connected to data correspondence. Uh, and this structure, which I call a seesaw dual reductive pair or a seesaw pair, give rise to a certain family of identities between uh, inner products of automorphic forms on different groups. So, of course, this sort of uh, so called seesaw diagram, I, I suppose they have already appeared in house work. Uh, but I guess the term seesaw pair and just the formalization of it uh, was done in uh, this paper of Steve. And these identities that he mentioned here, uh, you know, um, I guess uh, people call it seesaw identities and I, I will allude to this uh, later on. So what is the purpose of uh, my talk today? I mean, I gave quite an extensive uh, sort of reminder of what Steve's paper uh, from 1986 uh, was about. Uh, the goal of this talk is actually to discuss analogs of uh, these results for dual pairs and exceptional groups. Okay, so more precisely, um, I'm going to consider these three dual pairs. So they have a common member G2, 
Um, and here you have a PGL3 uh, with its outer automorphism group. Uh, this is a dual pen E6 with its outer automorphism group. It's in fact essential to consider this outer automorphism. It's just like in the classical case, you consider orthogonal groups and not special orthogonal groups. Okay. Uh, you have an inner form of that. So D cross, PD cross. So what is D? D is a cubic division algebra. So PD cross is an inner form of PGL3. This is contained in an inner form of E6. I don't consider auto automorphism here because in fact, there are none. I mean, uh, of course, as algebraic groups they have, but the non-identity component has no rational points. Uh, and finally, the other one is a PGSP6 in E7. So here, the, the groups of type E are all of adjoint type. Now, when you think about classical dual pairs, you, you think, um, as we saw earlier, symplectic space and a quadratic space. And so you're looking at automorphism groups of those spaces or isometry groups of those spaces. You can understand this uh, dual pairs here in the same style. I mean, uh, G2 is the automorphism group of the octonian algebra. And uh, these groups here are actually, uh, the way to think about them uh, is to think of them as automorphism of uh, Jordan algebra. For the PGL3 and its inner form, the Jordan algebra in question uh, is the Jordan algebra of three by three matrices uh, or, you know, or the division algebra. And in, for PGSP6, uh, the J here will be um, three by three Hermitian matrices with entries in uh, quaternions. But here the quaternions is split. So you see that uh, you know, in classical data correspondence, you, you have to work with uh, the linear algebra of uh, bilinear forms, symmetric or skew symmetric bilinear forms. But in the setting of exceptional dual pairs, you, are, you have to work with uh, the geometric algebra for these structures, things like octonian algebras, things like Jordan algebras. Uh, what about the Vey representation? Well, it, the role of the Vey representation is played by uh, the so-called minimal representation. Uh, I denote it by omega as before. Um, so the adjective minimum is meant to uh, suggest that this is the smallest infinite dimensional representation of E, E is E6 or E7. Okay. Um, now, what do you mean by the smallest infinite dimensional representation? How do you um, order the size of infinite dimensional objects? Well, one way is to look at the local character expansion. The local character expansion of the uh, uh, of the minimal representation, so of, of any admissible representation, right? when you pull back to the Lie algebra uh, by a general result of how and Harris Chandra can be written as a uh, linear combination of Fourier transform of nilpotent orbits, a nilpotent orbital integrals. So here we are saying that you know only very small orbit appear. So in these groups, of course, the zero orbit is is a new potent orbit that, that will be this term a constant. But uh, in the groups of type E6, E7, or type E, there is a unique next smallest orbit, called, uh, which I denote by O min here. And the character extension is just for a transform of O min. Okay. Uh, another way of thinking about it is to think that, well, you know, we usually think of infinite dimensional representations as being realized on spaces of functions on some underlying space. And you might treat the dimension of the underlying space as a measure of how big the representation is. Okay, I guess there are more functions in two variables than there are functions in one variable, something like that. Okay, um, so this uh, omega can be realized as a functions, as space of functions on a relatively small, a low dimension space. So in fact, half the dimension of O min. So you can think of it as a quantization of O min, I mean, the sense of um, geometric quantization, for example. And uh, in fact, uh, in a later slide, in the next few slides, um, I'm going to describe a model of uh, E7 realized as a space of function on some space, um, just to give you a sense of what this representation looks like. Uh, now, one uh, advantage, right, of working in this exceptional uh, for data correspondence is that uh, there's no need to go to a nonlinear cover. So these minimal representations are defined on the linear group. So one does not have to deal with the, the intricacies of a nonlinear cover. Okay. Okay. So um, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to try to discover you a model for this Bay representation. Okay. Uh, so first, I, I need to uh, I mean I need to give you some ingredients. Okay. So the first ingredient is the so-called exceptional Jordan algebra uh, J. So this is the algebra. Uh, so anyhow, as a vector space, this uh, the elements uh, look like that. They are three by three matrices, but they are Hermitian. I mean, you know, x, x bar, z, z bar, 
Okay. Uh, the entries A, B, C lie in the base field and the entries X, Y, Z lies in the octonians. So you can see this is a 27 dimensional space. Okay. Now, uh, since, so here are some structures that you can consider. So it's a three by three matrix X. So you can consider, for example, it's trace in the usual way. Okay. You can consider it's determinant computer in the usual way. So you can write it out. Okay. So you have, for example, so in this other way, you have a B times Y times Y bar, which is a B norm Y. Okay. Um, now you can talk about rank. So for example, it's a tree by tree matrix. So you say it has rank three if the determinant is not zero, right? Uh, now, so what is an element of rank less than equals to one is when all the two by two minus uh, are zero. So you're gonna get a bunch of equations. So um, the matrices of rank less than equals to one is a Zariski closed set. And um, the only element of rank zero is the zero matrix, okay? So this set of uh, elements of rank less than equals to one is actually a cone uh, with zero as the vertex. Now, I think that, you know, maybe the easiest way to think about this is to, you know, if you think of uh, X, Y, Z as uh, in the base field, then this is just a symmetric matrix. So you recognize this is something like what you use to define a Ziegler upper half space. Um, now, why is it called, why is it an algebra? Because there's a product uh, called a Jordan product, X circle Y um, is defined this way, um, where X, Y refers to the naive matrix multiplication uh, of two three by three matrix. Okay, okay so we, uh, I did this object. Okay, now uh, the other thing I need is to mention a Ziegler parabolic of E7. Oh, I'm going to give the model for E7 uh, only, okay? Um, so E7 has an analog of the Ziegler parabolic subgroup. Uh, how to describe it? Well, here's the thinking diagram of E7, and you know that maximal parabolic subgroups are obtained by removing one vertex. So the black vertex here is the one that I remove. Uh, after I remove it, I'm left with a, a thinking diagram of type E6. So I have a certain maximal parabolic whose levy is, uh, you know, the semi simple part of the levy has type E6. Okay. Uh, it's called a Ziegler parabolic because the new I mean, the unipotent radical is actually abelian. And it can be identified with J, okay? Just like in SP6, the Ziegler parabolic has a three by three symmetric matrices as the unipotent radical, okay? And of course the Levy factor M X on N by adjoint action. And in fact, this realized M as the similitude group for the determinant. Uh, the determinant is a cubic form. Okay, and you can consider its isometry group, right? And that actually would be E6, okay, the derived group of this M. Um, I mean, if you take the whole M, there's a GL1 part, right? And so you will scale the determinant. So it's a similitude group, if you wish. So you see that, um, you know, unlike the classical case where you have to work with quadratic forms, you have to work with uh, things which are of degree two, here you have to work with uh, things of degree three, cubic forms like this determinant. Okay, so now uh, I'm ready to give a model. Okay, so um, I guess I had used J1 to denote the rank elements of rank less than equals to one, but now let me just change notation and just use it to denote elements of rank precisely one. So with the zero matrix removed. Uh, then, okay, I want to describe omega as a P module. So this you think of this as something like the Schrodinger model of the Vey representation, okay? And it can be realized as functions on J1, okay? But here you see, I wasn't so precise. I was, I say that it was squeezed between compactly supported func uh, smooth functions, uh, and it's content in smooth functions, okay? But I didn't say exactly what it is. In fact, it's not so easy to say uh, what it is, and uh, I don't fully know myself, okay? But, uh, but, I, but what are some constraints satisfied by the functions in omega? So first they vanish at infinity, Richard, I guess. I, yeah. I, well, so what do you mean by rank one here? Uh, all those, I mean, the elements are, you, you know, Octonian, right? Uh, no, so this uh, J, the elements are three by three Hermitian matrices. Right. Uh, let me go back. So the rank is a possibility uh, yeah. three or? Uh, no, rank is oh, just a, rank, okay. yeah, it's a, all the two by two minus are zero. So they give you a bunch of equations. So for example, you look at the, let's say this two by two minor, right? A, B minus norm of Z. Right. It's zero. That's one equation. And then of course you have the principal, the three principal minors, then you have the off diagonal, right. the non-principal minor. So let's give a bunch of equations. Uh, okay. you know, the zero set are those things of rank less than equals to one. Yeah. Check while you're on this slide, 
Maybe it's yes. only fair to say that the real miracle is that even though X, Y, Z makes no sense, the trace of X, Y, Z makes sense. Uh, yeah, so you have to be a bit careful when you multiply things here because the octonion is a non-associative, I mean, it's non-commutative, I mean, but it's also non-associative. So you, you really have to put brackets everywhere. But it turns out that when you take the trace, no matter how you put, you know, multiply these three guys, it, it didn't uh -huh. matter. Yeah, the, the, the trace is well-defined. I mean, that's not like, I mean, it's not obvious. I mean, it's not by pure thought, but, but it is a... It is certainly a, a, a miracle, yeah. Okay, okay so um, yeah, so I, I guess the point is I want to say here is that there are some constraints on this function. So they have to vanish at infinity. Uh, remember that this uh, J1 is a cone, you know, there's a vertex and then there's the, 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 the other end, the light, light, light cone, right? And then towards infinity, it vanishes, okay? Uh, but it may not vanish at zero. If, it would, if the function vanish at zero, then it will be completely supported on this uh, J1, but, but there's some asymptotics. And this asymptotics is uh, detected by this quotient. I mean, the, the difference between omega and the completely supported one. And in fact, it is just the Jacquet module, the, the, the n co-invariance. Okay. Uh, now the action of P is given by this in this very natural way. So the levy uh, M X on uh, J, right, by a joint action. So, um, it's just a geometric action. There's some character here, which I ignore. And uh, as for the unipotent radical, it just acts uh, in this way. So for people, if you are familiar with the Schrodinger model, you recognize this just looks ex almost exactly the same as the Schrodinger model. Okay, of course, uh, you know, this only describes the action of P. If you want to describe actually the whole group, you know, you may need some extra element, or extra vowel group, vowel element. And roughly speaking, it should act by some sort of Fourier transform on the cone. Um, and uh, writing down this Fourier transform is uh, quite a challenge. And uh, in the Archimedean case, there was some work of uh, Kobayashi and his collaborators that did this. I mean, he tried to write the action of W as an integral transform, um, just like Fourier transform, right? It's a, you use the e to the two pi i, say x, y as the kernel. So here you have a more complicated kernel. Uh, in the PID case, there's some recent work of Kashtan and uh, Nadia Garevich uh, trying to explicate this for a transform on the code. But the point I want to make here is that for the purpose of computing Jacquet modules, you see that this model is good enough. This knowing this P action, uh, this is uh, once you have these formulas, you can try to compute a Jacquet module for different parabolics of the, of the dual pair, just as what Steve did in the classical case. Okay, okay so now uh, let's come to the uh, question. So what, what are the questions we want to consider? So for so for example, you take pi and you reduce the representation of G2, you can consider the big data leaf as before. This will be a smooth representation of the group H, which is this uh, automorphism of J. And uh, such that pi tends to theta pi is the maximal pi isotopic quotient. Okay, so I think the main questions here, I mean, I list them down, um, um, is all about controlling the size of this guy. Okay, you don't want it to be too big. Okay, so you can ask, is it of finite length? Okay. And uh, you can ask, does it have irreducible quotients? Okay. Uh, in fact, you, you can ask, is, it, is this irreducible quotient unique if it exists? You can ask the end of how duality. So all these questions are all about controlling, providing upper bounds for big data of pi. Okay. And uh, maybe this is a good time to address why I'm still working on this. Despite, um, you know, I was working with this kind of the same dual pairs in my thesis, uh, incidentally. Uh, well, the point was just that till now, um, I, for a long time, I guess, we don't know how to control the size of this. Okay. Now we, so, but then, uh, so what did I actually do in my thesis? We could not. Well, the point was just that if pi were not supercaspital, so you can, let's say, write it as an induced representation, a parabolically induced representation, then you can use, you can try to use Jacquet module techniques to, to provide upper bounds for theta pi. This was basically what I did in my thesis and um, following work, earlier work of uh, Gordon Savin and, uh, and others. Um, and for that, you just did the, you know, the model, for example, on the previous slide. So those models will have been there since the early mid 90s, for example. And yeah, but if pi was supercaspital, for example, um, it's not clear how to, how to control the size of big data pi, okay? And uh, that is kind of what uh, 
uh, we could do now. Okay, so here are the two theorems that I want to uh, present. So um, the first theorem is about how duality. So consider any one of these three dual pairs. When you take pi and you use the representation of G2, big data of pi has finite length. And it has, uh, so once you know it has finite length, of course, you will have irreducible quotients if it is not zero. And in fact, that irreducible quotient is unique. Uh, moreover, uh, we have this injectivity statement. So this is a how duality uh, theorem. I mean, instead of two, you could have stated it the other way, which is if you take a representation sigma of H, uh, then big data or sigma also has finite length and a unique irreducible quotient. So we have uh, that statement too, but I just stated it in this way. Okay. Uh, the second theorem is a dichotomy theorem. Um, so we have these three dual pairs, right? but I've written it down in this way. And the theorem says that if you have a representation pi of G2, it has non-zero data leaf to exactly one of PD cross or PGS P6. Okay. Uh, maybe I make a few comments about this. So first, why do I draw this picture here? Uh, well, when you look at this picture, you should think of this as two towers of uh, dual pairs. Okay, so you have G2 fixed. This is a tower, a very short one. Okay, uh, this is not even shorter. Okay. So in classical data correspondence, we saw just now we have those towers, right? the symplectic groups, for example. I mean, those are skyscrapers going off to infinity. But uh, in the world of exceptional groups, I mean, there only have finitely many exceptional groups. So we don't have skyscrapers. Okay? We have single story residence and maybe a two or three story bungalows. That's it. Okay? So this is an E6, E7. That's one, you can go one step higher, E8. G2 F cross F4 is a dual pair there. Um, of course, from E6, you can go down. And so, so okay, maybe there are, one or two basements, but generally that's it, okay? So the towers are all very short, okay? Um, but this uh, dichotomy is, uh, you know, in a classical case, such dichotomy results will be a consequence of this local conservation uh, relation. And this was uh, what uh, uh, Michael Harry, Steve, and uh, Jay Sweet uh, proved in their GEMS paper, uh, the one with the data dichotomy. Um, so they prove it in the context of unitary uh, dual pairs. Okay. So, so this is somehow an exceptional analog uh, of that statement. Um, okay. Now, it, you see why it is, is it good to have a a priori upper bound on this uh, big data of high, knowing that it has a unique use for quotient? It's because, uh, you know, um, this helps you a lot in you know, because I think the next step is you want to uh, ask, if I give you pi, what is data pi? Can you tell me what it, what it is? And um, so if you have an a priori bound like that, right? So you give me pi, if I manage to find a sigma, such that pi tensor sigma is an irreducible quotient, th then I know that's it, okay? This is, there are no other sigmas. You don't have to go around uh, looking for more because there aren't any more. So having this uh, a priori upper bound is, uh, you know, help you to, uh, to determine the data leaf precisely. Because if you, otherwise, even if you find a sigma, there could be like a hundred others. Um, okay. So I want to uh, give some discussion of the, how these statements are proved. Okay. Um, I already mentioned that uh, Jacke module is part of the game, part of it, and that it is actually has been available. Okay. So the, but the other ingredient in the paper was this doubling seesaw. And uh, I think the main point in the rest of the talk is to explain what is the substitute for this uh, doubling seesaw. Okay. But uh, let me start with these two questions. These are the first two questions in my list of questions. So first is the big data of pi of finite length. Uh, B, does it have irreducible quotients if it is non-zero? Okay, so it is clear that if you know A, then you know, then you know B because finite length, you have irreducible quotients. But in practice, uh, we first show B before showing A, okay? Uh, so let me explain uh, why that is the case. So suppose you, you consider big data of pi, then uh, you can write it uh, by, you know, by the Bernstein decomposition. You can write, you can split it as the sum of the cuspital part and the non-cuspital part, okay? Now, so, so let's try to prove statement B that, there, that, that this guy has, has irreducible quotients, okay? Now, case one, if the cuspital part is non-zero, well, these are semi-simple groups, so the cuspital part is, is a semi-simple representation. If it is not zero, it will have irreducible quotients. Okay? So if the cuspital part is not zero, you are done. Okay? So you just have to consider this part, the non-cuspital part. Uh, so in fact, what we show is the non-cuspital part has finite length. Okay? 
Now, once you show this, of course, uh, you know that big data of pi will have irreducible quotients, thus completing the proof of B. And uh, this is doable because all you need to do this is uh, Jacquet module computations. Of course, Jacquet module simply bring you down to the levy. So you have to do some induction. You know, there's an inductive uh, nature to this argument. Okay. Um, okay, so having done this, uh, you have shown B. And now when you come back to try to show A, uh, you see you already know this non-cuspital part is of finite length. So it remains to show that the cuspital part is of finite length. And in fact, what we show is that it is irreducible or zero as uh, what the how duality would require. Okay. And so as I said, this is done in the course of proving how duality. And in, um, in Steve's work, this is where the doubling seesaw is needed. Okay. And in fact, even though here, right, if pi were non cuspital you can use Jacquet modules again. And uh, uh, so the key case here is when pi is cuspital. Okay. And you look at the cuspital part of its data leaf. All right, so um, in the next slide, I'm going to uh, return to this doubling seesaw. And I want to recall how, uh, how it is used to prove, for example, the irreducibility of uh, the data pi when pi is cuspital. Okay. Um, or rather, I, I, I'll just explain that it used to be the small data pi when, it is, uh, when pi is cuspital. So this is the doubling seesaw. It's called doubling because you have doubled the space V. Okay, so V square is uh, basically V plus V. Okay. Um, when you have this seesaw diagram, you have what is called a seesaw identity. So you are starting with a pair of representation pi and pi prime of OV. Uh, so you're going to put, for example, pi prime here and pi contragradient there. Okay. And on S, this diagonally embedded SPW, you're going to put the trivial representation. So those are the initial ingredients. Once you are given this, so basically you are giving yourself representations on the lower step, uh, on the lower line here. Okay, So you can consider the data leaf of pi prime and pi check to SPW cross SPW. So there will be these two guys here. And then you can restrict those to the diagonal SPW and you compute uh, invariance, okay? the diagonal SPW invariance uh, of linear functional, SPW invariant linear functionals to see. Now, why, why are you computing this? Because, um, um, you know, let, let's imagine that, uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, roughly speaking, you are trying to detect whether these two guys are the same or not, right? Or whether they're dual of each other or not, okay? And uh, if, if pi prime equals to pi, you are roughly trying to detect uh, the length of this representation, okay? But uh, the seesaw identity allows you to transfer this computation. Uh, this computation is happened on the symplectic side but it allows you to transfer it to the orthogonal side. So it's this, this space is isomorphic to the data leaf of the trivial representation of SPW, two O of V square. Okay. So data one is some representation here, and you are restricting that to this subgroup and asking uh, you know, whether you see pi prime tensor pi check as a quotient. Okay. All right, so, so, so we want to compute this, okay, but uh, we can compute this the right hand side instead. Now, on the right hand side, so obviously you need to know what big data one is because otherwise you can't go on, so to speak. And so this is what is uh, the content of the Ziegler Bay formula, the data leaf of the trivial representation. So uh, we are in the local setting, so I call it local Ziegler Bay. And here is the theorem of Raleigh's that this big data one sits naturally inside a degenerate principal series induced from the Ziegler parabolic subgroup. Uh, you know, this is at some specific S naught that I wouldn't explicate here. Well, uh, it's just a containment, but for the purpose of this uh, motivation, we more or less want to pretend this is an equality, okay? Because if uh, that's the case, then we can replace this theta one by I of S naught, okay? So I of S naught is a very explicit degenerate principle series. And our next step is then to understand the restriction of this degenerate principle series to the subgroup OV cross OV. And now this is the, you know, this is the realm of Mackey theory because you are inducing a representation and then restricting it to another subgroup. So you are, as you imagine, there will be some uh, orbit computations. And this orbit computation was done in Steve's paper. Um, and what is the result? 
um, says that basically the restriction is the regular representation of OV. Well, that's not exactly true. It contains it, and uh, the quotient is very small. Okay. Uh, these are what people call the boundary uh, strata, so to speak. Okay. So for all intent and purpose, again, for the sake of motivation, let's pretend this containment is an equality. Then after both these bullet points, you can replace this data one by the regular representation. Now, if you, once you do that, then you know that you understand this space very well. It's either zero if pi prime is not isomorphic to pi, or it's one dimensional if pi prime is isomorphic to pi. Okay, so as a result, we get, so for example, right, this, uh, if pi and pi prime are super cuspital, then this small difference, small quotient here doesn't matter because uh, Steve had also worked out precisely what they are and they, they, they are all induced representations. So you don't see cuspital things in here. Okay, so as a consequence, you get uh, this home. So you're trying to detect uh, you know, whether these two are the same or different. Okay, and you're trying to detect how, how long data pi is and what is its length. Um, so you're looking at this home space. Now, uh, it can be dominated by this one with the small data being replaced by the big data. Okay, and, uh, and then pretending that these two are equality, we get this, uh, this right-hand side, which is either zero or one-dimensional. Okay, and that proves what we want. So that's what this uh, doubling seesaw does for you. Okay. Um, now, the um, unfortunate thing is that in the um, exceptional data correspondence, there's no doubling seesaw. Uh, somehow, um, the geometry of uh, exceptional group is so sporadic that, that, that there's no uh, systematic construction like this. Okay. Uh, anyhow, there are only finally many of them, so you can't just keep doubling. Right? And okay, but uh, so I want to explain next uh, how we replace this uh, doubling seesaw argument in, uh, in Steve's paper. Okay. Um, now, I want to think of the doubling seesaw as a manifestation of the following general principle. Okay, uh, what is this principle? It says that if you have a dual pair, this is just an abstract or nonsense, nonsense, G cross H, uh, and you can consider data correspondence between G and H, uh, then uh, very often data correspondence relates a period P on G to a period Q on H. Uh, let me explicate what I mean. So what, what do I mean by period on G? Well, a uh, period on G uh, is given by a pair of a subgroup G prime. So there's a, there's a prime here, I guess. And a character chi on G prime. So, so for example, G prime could be uh, the maximal unipotent subgroup and uh, chi could be a generic character, then you are talking about the Whittaker model or Whittaker period. Uh, it could be a reductive subgroup and you can take chi to be trivial character, for example. Okay. So that's what I mean by a period P. Uh, and okay, so the, if you have a representation pi, then the P period of pi is just this home space. Okay. Now, so what, do I, what, what does it mean to say that, you know, period P on G and Q on H are related. It means the following precise statement. Uh, you give me as uh, initial data, pi and irreducible representation of G, and you give me a period on the other group H. Okay, then the, what the principle say is that there is a corresponding period P depending only on Q, okay. uh, such that, yeah, so maybe the, the way that this statement is uh, quantified is not so right, so it's a, given a period Q on H, there is a corresponding period P on G, such that for all pi in irreducible representations of G, you have the following isomorphism of home spaces. The this P period of pi, henceforth, I'm just going to write P pi, okay, is isomorphic to Q of big data of pi. Okay, so there's an explicit statement. I mean, maybe false, but, uh, but it's a precise, uh, very precise statement. That you have an isomorphism of these two home spaces. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see how this uh, principle help us. Okay. Um, so I, I just uh, explained in the next couple of slides, just an abstract setup. Okay. Um, so let's start with the following. Uh, so here I have three uh, bullets. These are the initial ingredient in my, in my game. Okay. I have a dual pair, G cross H. I give myself pi and sigma, irreducible representations of G and H respectively, such that pi tensor sigma is an irreducible quotient of omega. Okay. Now, this also means that if you look at big data of pi, sigma is an irreducible quotient of it, and uh, pi is an irreducible quotient of big data of sigma. 
Okay, then I give myself a period on one of the groups. So here I just pick age. Okay, so I call it Q1. This is a seed. Okay, um, so for example, you can take the Whitaker period. Okay, now let's apply the principle. Okay, assuming that it holds, right? Then I have a period Q1. So by the principle, there is a period P1 on G such that I have an isomorphism of home spaces. The P1 period of pi is isomorphic to the Q1 period of theta pi. Of course, the Q1 period of theta pi contains the Q1 period of sigma because sigma is a quotient of um, big data of pi. Okay, so I will get this. But now I'm going to turn the table around and, and uh, apply the principle again, but the, the other way. Because now I have a period P1 on G. By the principle, there is a period Q2 on H such that you know, the same thing holds. Okay, so I, I write down the, what the principle gives you. You have isomorphism of these two period spaces. Uh, now, the point is that uh, in, you know, um, this Q2 need not be the same as the Q1 that you begin with. Okay, so then you can play this game again. Now you turn it around again, you say that now you have Q2 on H, it, it is going to beget a period P2 on G, such that you have isomorphism of home spaces together with this style containment. So inductively, you're going to get a sequence of periods, PIQI, uh, you know, such that you have this style of containment. So um, the first containment here is just because sigma is a quotient of theta pi. So this is on the H side, right? And now, whenever you have this isomorphism, is, is, this isomorphism is given by the principle. Okay. So it allows you to pass from one side to the other. Then of course, you have PI of uh, pi is containing PI of theta pi because pi is a quotient of theta sigma. And now you apply the principle, you pass back to the Q side, and you can just do this, okay? So basically, you have a diagram like this, okay? You have the G and H, you, you, you start with your seed period, Q1. It gives birth to P1, and P1 gives birth to Q2, Q2 gives birth to P3. So it's kind of like a game of uh, back and forth of, uh, of uh, ping pong, okay? So we we'll call it a period ping pong. Um, okay, you can think of it as tennis, okay? Maybe if you don't like table tennis. Um, so, uh, so, so this is what the, the principle gives you if you can apply it uh, sort of just naively. So this is an abstract setup. And uh, of course you will ask like, how does the doubling seesaw fall into this setup? And I, I will explain um, you know, maybe in the next slide. Okay, but, uh, but before that, I want to explain how this, uh, how this you know, you, you ask how does this rally end? Is it going to go on forever? Uh, certainly it cannot go on forever, okay? So the next slide will explain how this uh, rally is supposed to end. Of course, it could end in, you know, there could be more ways than one that it could end, but I just want to point out one typical way in which it can end. So empirically, when one do, do this style computation in examples, one sees that the, the group, so the P, we have a sequence of periods PI associated with some subgroups GI of G. These subgroups tend to become more and more reductive. For example, you may start with your seed of Whitaker, which is totally unipotent. You know, we do it. Maybe you get a Whitaker as well on, on, on G, and then you, when you compute a Whitaker on G, you're not going to get a Whitaker of H back. You're going to get something that has a slightly larger uh, reductive part. Okay, the groups will become increasingly reductive. And finally, at some point, it actually becomes reductive. Okay, and when, when it becomes reductive, this is when the rally is almost at its end. Okay, because in that case, the principle takes on a slightly different form. Okay, in that case, uh, so. GI is reductive. So what are you doing here? You have a representation say sigma on H. You do is data leave to G and you want to restrict to GI. And you know, for example, you, it's a trivial character here. So now you see that this is something like the doubling seesaw that uh, we had. Uh, so, so in that case, uh, you know, you, because you know, when the period has a unipotent part, you can use this same tools as what you use for the Jacquet module computation to compute those periods. But when it's reductive, you don't have it, okay? So what typically happens is that there is a seesaw diagram. There will be some group H tilde that comes out from nowhere, okay? And you can then apply the seesaw identity. The seesaw identity will say that the PI period of theta sigma, so you have sigma here, you leave there, theta sigma, it's strict here, um, will be, uh, so now you have to look at the data leaf of trivial representation from GI to H tilde. So there's this, okay? And then you have to restrict the H paired with sigma. This is exactly the same setting as the doubling seesaw, except it's not the doubling seesaw, okay? But it will be some seesaw. So the point is that, so why is this different from before? Because, you know, this 
allows you to pass from the side of G to the side of H. But what you get on H is not a period, but a cold period because uh, you're restricting for something bigger as opposed to restricting to a subgroup. Okay. Now, uh, but motivated by you know, uh, what you see with the doubling seesaw, you, 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 it will not surprise you that the end game is going to involve, well, first you have to identify this data one, you hope to show by an analog of the local Zika Bay that it is contained in some degenerate principal series of H tilde. Okay, then morally speaking, you can replace data one by, by this degenerate principal series. I mean, it's not exactly, but you know, there'll be some error term that you have to deal with. Uh, but then now you have to understand the restriction of this degenerate principal series to H. You do this by Mackey theory, of course. And here, here you need a miracle. And the miracle is that, uh, so in the case of doubling seesaw, we get that it contains the uh, regular representation of, of the group in question of H. Here, here you will not, but you get something like this. Okay, And the, the, up to a small error. And uh, what's important about this thing, I mean, is, uh, is that here the index is one. Okay, each one was the, say for example, is the group associated to our seed period. Okay, all right. So, the, so let's pretend that in fact these uh, containment are just equality. Okay, so it then it means that in the, uh, going back to the previous page, so you have this thing, right? Instead of big data one, you can replace by induced from H1 to H of chi one. And by Frobenius reciprocity, you see that you're just recovering the, Q1 period of sigma, okay? Uh, I guess that's what I, I write here. So this, from PI, you're supposed to get, be get uh, maybe QI plus one, but the QI plus one turns out to be Q1. So you get Q1, okay? And now when you put all these things together, because uh, when you apply the principle, you get this chain of containments of period spaces. Uh, here, you're supposed to get QI plus one, but you instead get a uh, sigma. Okay, so you reckon you, you see that this is a you know it closes on itself, it's a cycle. Okay, you have a chain of containment that closes up. So certainly you like to say that hence equality holds. But uh, of course, you know, if these were infinite dimensional spaces, then maybe you can't actually say that. Okay, but if they were finite dimensional, if as long as one of these spaces is finite dimensional, then equality uh, is forced to hold. Okay. So how does this help towards the how duality? Uh, so let's suppose that in fact, uh, the, these spaces are finite dimensional uh, and non-zero, okay? So some finite dimension D, okay? Then just looking at the beginning part of this chain, uh, let me see, is that the beginning part? Yeah, so the beginning part. So, so I have Q1 of sigma, its dimension is D, okay? But of course this containment are all equality now. So, so this is equal to the dimension of Q1 D does pi, the next term equal to the next term, okay? and so on, okay? All right, so now suppose that I want to check that beta pi has a unique irreducible quotient. Let's proceed by contradiction. Suppose there are two, sigma and sigma prime, okay? Um, now you can apply the above to, so when we get this uh, chain, right? We, we started with pi and sigma, okay? But now you can start with pi and sigma or you can start with pi and sigma prime, okay? And, and you're going to get the same uh, chain of equalities here, okay? The equalities hold with sigma replaced by sigma prime. But this leads to a contradiction, you see, because when you look at uh, Q1 of theta pi, of course, you know, since this thing is a sigma plus sigma prime is a quotient of theta pi, so the periods for theta pi will contain the period space of uh, these two guys, okay? So you have this inequality here, but you know that all these spaces here have dimension D. And so that leads to a contradiction. Okay. So it's not necessarily here to know that this D is one, for example. Okay, okay so, um, so that explains the, the, just the formal setup of how um, this uh, period ping pong uh, helps you to, you know, towards proving how, how duality. Uh, now you are so in the case of the doubling seesaw, what is the period ping pong? So you have the doubling seesaw, you are starting with a pi prime and pi check, right? On OV cross OV. Uh, you do the data leaf to SPW cross SPW. Okay, so that is your group H. Uh, what is the period? The period is the diagonal, the diagonal SPW uh, invariance, okay? 
Now it's already reductive. So, um, so the seesaw come into play, you go to the other side, and then you see that you get degenerate principle series, you have to make it theory and so on. Uh, what do you get? You get the period, uh, also the diagonal OV invariant period. So you see that this is a, uh, you know, it relates G cross the diagonal G period in G cross G to the diagonal H period in H cross H. Okay. So in, in the, in the, for the particular dual pairs, we have, uh, uh, we have to play this game two times. So I, let me quickly run through it. So one time we start with Whitaker, it begets some Schleicher period on PGSB6. You play it again, it, it, uh, it gives for a Jacobi period on G2. Uh, and maybe you should play it one more time. But in, in fact, once you come to this stage, we can relate the Forage Jacobi on G2 to the Whitaker. So somehow we manage to close up on ourselves. Uh, the other case, we actually work with this uh, Forage coefficients along the Heisenberg parabolic of G2. So these are parameterized by cubic algebras. When you take the generic ones, they are parameterized by etau cubic algebras. So when we do this, uh, compute this uh, period, we're going to get a period on H, on the, the other group H. Uh, now, in fact, it turns out to be a reductive period already. Uh, in the case of PGL3 and its inner form, it's the torus period associated to E. I mean, E is one of the data uh, in the period. Uh, in PGSP6, it's SL2E. So for example, if E were the split algebra, F cross F cross F, this is SL, SP2 cross SP2 cross SP2 in SP6. So this is already reductive, so we'll end up with a seesaw where the other group here is a group that hasn't made its appearance yet, so it's a group spin 8. And then we have the uh, seesaw and Mackey. When we do the Mackey, we recover back our uh, psi E uh, period. Okay, so you see that in this example, you know, it's not exactly a rally, right? It's not like Nadal and Federer, you know, and Rallon Gall Gallows in, on the clay cards, right? This is more like Wimbledon where you serve and volley and it's over, okay? Um, okay, um, that's good. It means less work, so to speak. Um, okay, then I think this slide is just to tell you that it gives the containment, but I have, I've already described the, the abstract picture, so I'm going to uh, skip this. I only want to point out that why do we have to play the game two times? The first time we use Whitaker period, so we are detecting generic things, but you know, not everything is generic, right? So, so this will only detect part of it. But for non-generic things, uh, the point is that this, why do we consider this other uh, for a coefficient is because we know that the dimension is finite for all E, and it's non-zero for some E, unless pi is trivial representation or something like that. Okay, so I want to end up with an uh, advertisement. Uh, so what the heck is this? Um, well, uh, as you know that, uh, you know, Steve, uh, I started with describing this Steve's 1986 paper. And uh, in fact, um, you can learn a lot looking at that paper. But a few years, maybe like 10 years after that, he had actually uh, a set of notes on local data correspondence, which somehow cover the material in that paper in a, uh, you know, at a slower pace because it's more expository. And, and that uh, lecture notes, I think, have been of use to many people in the community. So uh, what you're seeing here is actually a book project that um, was initiated by Suichiro Takeda uh, two or three years back. Uh, and, uh, that, and he got uh, myself and Steve uh, involved. Uh, our goal is to write a book about data correspondence, starting with uh, Steve's notes from 1996 um, and incorporating the developments in the last 10 years. Okay, because now we know to, how to prove how duality using the essentially techniques in Steve's paper. We know the local conservation relation. So we like to write up this story in a sort of log logically, uh, in a logical way, as opposed to the historical way of how things happen. Um, so anyhow, I'm just uh, advertising this. Uh, I mean, you know, as you can see, it's quite long already. It's like, I mean, I don't know if you can see this. It's like almost four, 500 uh, pages. So, uh, well, uh, so, so far, uh, as I say, it's based on Steve's note, and Suichiro has been doing all the, uh, all the writing. Uh, I guess my main job is to do the marketing here, and uh, also uh, Steve, just to, I know that you have been partying a lot this past week because of the birthday conference, but, uh, but uh, just to give you a heads up that you might expect a big document from Suichiro at some point for, for your bedside reading. Okay. And uh, okay, with that, uh, happy birthday. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful talk, uh, Wita. So, if you can join me in. Okay.
Okay, are there any questions or comments? I'd like to make two historical comments. First, the term, uh, the, the phenomenon of dichotomy was first observed probably in, in uh, Walsberger's thesis on uh, the Shimura correspondence. Yeah. Uh, but the term, and then it was uh, developed by uh, Steve and uh, Steve Rallis uh, in different situations. And I, but Steve, I'm pretty sure, is the one who came up with the term, which was, has been uh, a very, uh, very uh, popular ever since then. I think uh, he should, it was it probably appeared first in our joint paper with uh, Jay Sweet. The other thing that you said that the uh, Kudla program started in 1997 with the publication of that paper, but actually it started in 1989. And I know that uh, because uh, Steve, I was sitting in Steve Rallis's office when Steve Kudla called him and explained the analytic side of the program. And for then, for many years, I was asking him when he was going to uh, when he was going to write this up, and uh, he was he wanted to be very very careful, I uh, uh, and that's why it took so long for for yeah. for the paper finally to appear. Yeah, Thank, thanks for the comments, uh, Michael. Actually, I should add that one thing about this dichotomy idea. Of course, in fact, the most beautiful example is the Depender Prasad thesis, uh, which is the dichotomy for, that's involved in the triple product. Um, and I think that, and also in our, in the business about Jacquet's conjecture. And so I, mm. I think it may actually be, as you say, there's this dichotomy in Walsperger and it has its roots there. Mm. Uh, but I think the next uh, stage is actually in uh, Dependra's work. And then the theta dichotomy maybe follows a little bit after that, actually. Um, that was one comment. The other comment is that just the, the, the seesaw and the term seesaw and the, the notion of this changing the dual pairs, you mentioned Howe's work. And of course, Howe certainly uh, in, uh, sort of set up the notion of doubling and the importance of doubling and all these constructions. But I'm, I wasn't actually aware of, for I never found, I never found the seesaw in Howe. To be honest, where I found mm -hmm. the seesaw, and this is rather peculiar, is I found the seesaw in Hecke. Um, so I actually started with the global incarnation of this whole thing. I was yeah. reading Hecke's old papers about uh, theta mm -hmm. series for real quadratic fields. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized that in that paper, at some point, he takes some period and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so I actually found the seesaw in Hecke uh, by oh, reading I Hecke. I mean, I still remember when I found it. I was sitting at the, the table in the little apartment that I had in College Park, Maryland. I uh, got very excited that there was this idea that, oh, this variable here, but it's this, another dual pair if I change the, the torus and so on. Uh, so I really found it directly in Hecke. Yeah. Um, and uh, how then, after I wrote this, this, this article, how uh, in the article on seesaw pair, I only discussed these sort of global applications. I had in mind these sort of local mm. global periods, which are the mm. analog of what was in Hecke and some generalization of that. And uh, how was the one who had the idea that, well, okay, but we just do it in terms of representation theory, then you get these multiplicity spaces. And Roger mm -hmm. Howe has a paper mm -hmm. where he applies seesaw to that. So that's the, the thread there. And I just want to make one final comment about that whole business. And that is that uh, when I understood the seesaw and, and how to do it for Hecke, then I try to do the, the case of the uh, seesaw where I take the uh, uh, ON1 SP and then restrict from SP to UN. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you go up to UN1. And mm -hmm. so what you see is you see ON1 periods are given by special values of single modular forms, right? So this is mm -hmm. the generalization mm -hmm. of what Hecke did for the case N equals mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a very, very long, and at that time for me, a very hard paper. I mean, I struggled with this paper for a long, long time. And mm -hmm. it's my least cited paper. I think you'll find that <laughs> at the time, it has, even now, maybe it has three citations. And so this is a forgotten paper, oddly well, enough. Steve even though it, it contains quite general uh, idea about how to construct holomorphic N forms on UN1 and take their periods on uh, totally real uh, sub manifolds and mm. view those as va special values of Siegel modular forms. And this is very, very, very au courant in some sense. And yet I think at that time, since then there's only two citations of that paper. That's at the bottom of the list. Steve, there are citations and there are citations, but but um, we all know how powerful notation and terminology are. And the terminology of seesaw was just so brilliant that, I mean, it, it, it's incredible. 
<laughs> so did, did you remember do you remember steve uh when you like come up with this term this one? yeah um, like why the why this really it could be some quality. other name right yeah it's more well, children I think, true. I think CISA... yeah 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 of course i had i mean the playground was a, a common <laughs> another place i actually it was before i had small children that i did this i mean i discovered this and i think immediately when i saw it in heck i called it a seesaw at least in my head i remember at that time so I don't remember oh. what that year what that it was. I could check when I was living in that apartment, but it was sometime be yeah. well before the Katata conference, where I wrote the paper mm. about it. Um, yeah. So, and and the other thing I should add about the just the history of the whole thing was I explained this idea to Steve Rollis. Um, he immediately you see the seesaw it doesn't isn't about doubling. It's about you pass to a subgroup and you get bigger mm. on the other side. It's nothing to do with doubling. And Steve was the one who immediately saw it. doubling. Ah, wait, this does something. And the, the L functions and, and its role in the doubling business was immediately something that he saw as relevant to his work with Piotrowski Shapiro on these L functions. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and also it showed the fact that the Siegel formula was gonna be global Siegel formula was gonna be absolutely crucial in applications. And it's at that time that Steve and I started working on the Siegel A formula because mm -hmm. of the seesaw yeah. because, and the relation with the L function. So in other words, Steve saw that it was related to the L function and that the crudal, critical ingredient on the global level was to understand theta of one. But yes. globally, that's the Siegel formula. And then at that stage, we realized, well, okay, you need Siegel formula, not just in the Siegel and Bayes original convergent range, which was all that existed yeah. at that time. And yeah. Steve already was thinking about this extension, but then he saw that the seesaw would, would really make that absolutely critical. Uh, yeah. And then we went from there into doing the Siegel formula. Um, so anyway, that's some, just a historical yeah. comment about seesaw. Uh, we okay. have uh, one question for you for the for this uh, exceptional uh, theta. So, do you, uh, is there any uh, you know like reducibility for the local zero v like like in the case of Steve, <laughs> what he, in his paper on the central derivative of Eisenstein series, where crucially is, is you have a reducibility phenomenon at the central point. Oh, yes, I mean yeah. Right. So um, so, so in the the examples that we are looking at is. Uh, in the so-called almost equal rank case, it's like O2n, SP2n, as opposed to, uh, you know, O2n plus one, MP2n. Or rather, maybe let's do a unitary group. Instead of UN, UN, it's more like UN, UN plus one. So the, the, the degenerate principle series is not at the point zero, but it's at a point half. Of course, that degenerate principle series is also reducible. I mean, and you, it's important for us to understand. So big data of one is a sub or a quotient of it. And it's important to understand this degenerative series, exactly what is constituent and how right. they can be described in terms of the data one. So this we had to do ourselves. I mean, it was uh, done in this, um, not in this same paper, but uh, we, we had a release a paper uh, last, uh, like maybe two, two, three weeks ago, a, a super long one. But uh, part of that, uh, I mean, that do something else, but a part of it was to supply this ingredient, the, the structure of this, uh, Degenerate principle series at that point. So you have a sort of complete understanding for for the for this degenerate principle series at that point. Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah, that's right. I mean, um, not just at that point, but but that this that is the most interesting point. And in fact, the structure. This is why we have the dichotomy is because it is reducible. And after you know, imagine you semi simplify it, then you have a big data of one coming from the PGSP six situation or dual pair, and you have a big data of one coming from the PD cross. So, so these two sum together is the degenerate principle series, and that's what that's what is responsible for the dichotomy. Mm -hmm. This is the same phenomenon as what you say at a central point where you you, you bring the two pieces, yeah. and then either although, this one contributes or that one contributes. Uh -huh. Although here the two groups involved, you said one is PG PGSP six, and otherwise yes. PGO three, right? Or yeah, it's inner form of PGO three, the, the compact uh compact PGO three. Oh, so there are exactly two sort of two two uh. Two, uh, I mean, two constituents, two irreducible constituents. Uh, no, the, the big data of one the, for the PGSP six, it, it's the actually it's like length sub. three. Let's, uh, let's yeah, three. they have a common sub module, right? Yeah, yeah, it's two irreducible quotient and one irreducible sub. It, it's like a three, it's like a big, a, a rectangle at the bottom and two square at the top. Yeah. So, so the big data so of one for the PGSP six is. Theta? 
Uh, no, the sub is not a data. I mean, I'm at a point half. So the the big data of one from PGSP six is is a maximal sub module reducible. So it is the the sub and one of the tiny one on top, and the the remaining tiny one is the big data one from PD cross. I mean, the from the PD cross situation. So does this also so the two sub modules? Uh, there's one sub and two I'm just wondering if, if quotient. The two sub modules have some intersection. So yeah. No. So no. So here? yeah. So so from the PD cross uh, situation, the big data one embeds as a sub of the degenerate physical series at minus half, whereas mm -hmm. the PGS series embeds it as at half, right? So, so if you right. try to, if you think it as I half, the, the one from PD cross is a quotient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's why I, when I wrote it, I think I wrote it as a sub quotient or something like that. But I guess, I guess I'm trying to understand. So the analog in the symplectic case, you would mm -hmm. have two sub modules whose sum is everything. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. Some that's right. Common sub module. There would be a common that's sub right. module, right? So that's right. Two yes. big pieces like this and one yes. common sub module. That's right, that's right. And that that's common right. sub module in the symplectic case is a quotient from the other side. Yes, that's right. By that's the right. intertwining operator. That's and right. So that, but the question now is, in your case, is it the same? And as I'm asking what that sub module is, is, is there a common sub module? A two there is a common sub module, yeah. yeah. It's just exactly module? the same structure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but the, the okay. sub module well, have no just, yeah. the, the sub module uh, is not a data one, right? One of the maximal sub module okay. is a data one, and the, the remaining small little right. piece is the is also a data yeah. one. Yeah. So yes. I see. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just at the point the half or thing. minus half. Yeah, because you are going to a slightly bigger group right. or a slightly smaller group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So one no, case is I, half. I think the point is that that that, that small guy. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering at, at a half though, you have the yes. two big pieces and their intersection is some irreducible, presumably, right? That's that, right, that's right. And that should that's be right. the sockle. That's the sockle. That's right. All induced, right? Okay. That's right. And what I'm asking is what is that representation? Uh, well, it, it is not relevant for the, I mean, we, we can say what it is. Uh, no, it's I, a I don't know if, you don't need to know, but I'm just wondering if you have, if you know what that is, that's all I'm asking. Yeah, we know what that is. What, what yeah. that, I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, it's a, it, these are representations from... of uh, spin eight, the quasi spin spin eight associated to a cubic I see. algebra. So, yeah, okay. uh, you know, and we are looking at an unramified principal series. So we know that these are some representation of Iwohori's factor, and we can say what it is. For example, by giving a Iwohori okay. okay. hacker module. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but it I is know, not okay. uh, it is not equal to a data one. That's what. Yeah. So so. Right. Okay. I understand. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay, well, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, please join me in thanking Vitek again. Uh, thank you. And, uh, I hope you get some rest. <laughs>